Thank you. Um, hi. <laughs> this is quite strange. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me. I'm sorry, the reason I can't be there is because I have a live performance event at Tate Modern tonight with Joel Terlink, so there's a weird resonance with our theme. Um, and doing this via Skype has made me realise how terrifying it must be for the artists doing performance room. So I'm sorry, Emily Royston and everybody else, <laughs> for making you do this weird setup. Anyway, um, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, a way I've been thinking through the relationship between performance and the institution. Um, I've got a kind of provisional title, From the Shadows, Performance and the Post-Liminal Museum. And I'm going to read a bit from my notes. It's a little bit early for me still in my thinking. So I wanted to think really about how the programming of performance in institutions has begun to inflect the setup of the institution and the ritual of the institution. And to think about how performance that had initially been programmed perhaps as something of a sideshow, it's often referred to in Tate at least, as the additional programming, how by inviting this mode of uh, art making into the museum, how it starts to inflect the museum's own setup and its own ritual and starts to expose it as a live entity that whose systems and setups have a choreography of their own which artists' interventions begin to press on. Um, in thinking this through, I was really thinking back to the origins of the idea of performance art proper, uh, the high period of performance art in the 1960s and 70s, and thinking about that a little bit back to basics in relation to anthropological ideas of ritual and how that might be a useful metaphor to think about the museum itself. So in particular, I was thinking about Victor Turner's understanding of liminality as a state of in-betweenness and how that relates to this high period of performance art and also as a metaphor how it could be used to think about a state of transition for the museum as an institution in itself. So just to recap on that theory, um, Victor Turner obviously drew on the writing of Arnold von Gennett from 1908, his work Rites of Passage, which was thinking about how ritual organized the transition of individuals between states, between adolescence and adulthood, or, or between seasonal changes. And obviously within the phase of liminality in these kind of ritual practices, the individual is often abased, disorientated, goes through this period of um, dis, dissimulation before passing transformed into a new order. And metaphorically this, well, this was played out as an idea obviously in the kind of high period of performance that was to do with endurance and pain and self-abasement, the work of Chris Burden, Marina Abramovich, Gina Pane, Stuart Brisley et al. But I think I was beginning to think about it differently, not just around body art, but about the idea of the kind of twilight of liminality and the shadow spaces or the the kind of repressed shadow side of art in performance and how we might think about how performance's relationship to the canon of art history and to the presentation of art in, in the museum might be figured through that metaphor. I would say that in, in tape terms, in museum terms, performance has had this kind of shadowy presence until very recently, it's been, you know, originally in the 70s and 80s, it would, well, prior to that, obviously, performance was happening in artist studios um, in the street, in, in all kinds of non-official spaces outside the market and outside the institution. But as it began to come into institutions in maybe the late 70s and 80s, it was often through the education program or the, you know, after hours. And even when we began the performance program at Tate in 2003, that's still very much the case. And Stuart Comer and I also struggle with both our respective programs with this idea of additional programming versus core programming. So thinking about this, the marginalized shadow spaces of performance against the ritual of the white cube 
I was beginning to think how through how this kind of performance view, this view from the shadows, through the um, desires of artists to work differently has, be has begun to kind of press on the ritual that we're used to, the ritual of the disembodied eye, the kind of spiritual spectator who Brian O'Doherty talks about. A ritual that has been set up over the years through, you know, a, a total deferential attitude towards objects. Everything about the choreography of the museum as it exists now is set up in order to preserve objects, to protect them, to keep them behind barriers, to handle them in a certain way. Every procedure, every system on the database is about things. Um, and when we put performances on, obviously, it's about bodies that get in the way of that system. But I've I want, you know, I've been thinking a lot then, what does it mean for performance to come out of the shadows? And as it has done in the work of many artists in the past decade, of Tino Segal, Roman Ondak, Tanya Bruguera, when it comes out of the shadows into the daylight, into the bright lights of the galleries, does that mean that, you know, we've got, come past that liminal phase and that now there's a, a new setup? I think that has also begun to happen actually with the ways in which many museums have made newly visible archival or documentary material relating to performance shown in relation to objects. Many people, uh, this, so this question I think of, of whether, you know, this liminal phase, once it, um, starts to, like I say, inflect our everyday experience of the, the mainstream spaces of the museum. The question that's come up for me and for many critics, I think, especially since we opened the tanks at Tate, is whether this represents a taming of the medium, whether the critical and transgressive potential that performance had when it was supposedly anti, well, when it was anti-market and anti-museum, whether that's lost by an institutional embrace um, but, I mean, thinking from a practical perspective on one hand, the way that work has been acquired for the museum, Tino's work is the classic example of a work that apparently acquiesces to the object-oriented uh, object system by being additioned, being, you know, a performance that is repeatable, that's object-like, it's kind of dragged up as an object. Actually, once it gets in, it refuses to settle in the way that an object does, which is both problematic because it's harder to show. You can't just bring it out like you bring a painting. But it also has this agency still within the museum of, of liveness, which is working against and, and forcing changes in what's valued and how we do things. Um, I wanted to mention as a kind of important foundation for the presence of performance and this relationship between liveness and permanence, especially in Tate and for me, a work that was one of the first works we programmed at Tate, um, that I programmed by Mark Leckie, that was called Big, ba Big Box Statue Action. I've got one slide of it there, if you could, it's the next slide. Um, But this was a work, at the time when I invited Mark to do this performance, he was making work in his studio, in a car park in Soho, in a pub in Brixton. And I did worry about the question of inviting him to make something, you know, against a backdrop. This was at Tate Britain when the performance programme was originally in both spaces. I, I wanted to invite him to make something at Tate, but I thought, is this a loss of authenticity to show such work against the backdrop of neoclassical columns and pre-Raphaelite paintings? Um, what surprised me about his response was that he immediately requested to borrow a work from the permanent collection, which was this Jacob Epstein sculpture from 1943, Jacob and the Angel. And he positioned it in the most classical space, this octagon space in the Devine galleries and had a sound system built that was the exact proportions of the Epstein. So they, 
was set up in dialogue. And he made this music piece, uh, sound piece, that was a three-part attack, serenade, and synthesis. But what was extraordinary about this was a... Uh, <clears throat> okay, thank you. <laughs> that he affected... <laughs> like, he, for me, what was extraordinary about this was that he thought of a way of reconfiguring the high modernist art encounter of the spectator with a social situation. So it kind of broke apart the usual way that we imagine we see art. And usually, actually, <clears throat> when we've done tests in tape, the way people look at art is in very quick, sort of three seconds. Whereas this was a 20 minute um, encounter with a, an art object through time and also aware of this circle of viewers around the piece. So making a new kind of template <clears throat> and a new kind of ritual after hours, but nevertheless with the full gallery lighting on in this space, it was very much a conflation of the shadow perspective and the white cube perspective into one. And I had this strong sense that he created a situation where we were the institution temporarily. And I thought about the way Simon Najami talked about um, the freedom of Laboratoire Agiart in Senegal in the 70s in a context where there was not an infrastructural setup for art. He said, then the, you know, we had the, there was the freedom to institute as a verb. And it was very much what this piece felt like, that the institution could be us and it could be this social situation. So to sum up, because I now probably only have three minutes, um, I think that by coming out of the shadows, we've been, been through this kind of liminal period with performance, but the disorder and disruption invited by both the practical and conceptual presence of performance in the museum has begun to press the institution to adapt itself and its rules Performance's refusal to occupy the designated spaces, both architecturally and conceptually, whether in the museum database, you know, the corridors or the gallery spaces, or how we, what we value, presses upon the museum's culture in active ways. The museum, oops, sorry, I'm on my place. Uh -oh. What's evolving, I think, um, and new positions and new priorities in terms of the institution's political choreography. A very useful point of reference for me was a text by David Graeber um, in 2005, which is about fetishism as a form of social creativity. And he goes back to um, looking at 16th to 18th century trade uh, encounters between African and European traders, where he says, Mar through Marxism, we have developed a fundamental misunderstanding of the idea of fetishism that's predominant in commodity fetishism, because he said the European traders mistook, in their encounters with African traders, they mistook the objects used in social rituals to form bonds and agreements for um, what was being valued. What was actually being valued was the agreement, the performance, the social ritual, and to make fetish could be um, the way a face was painted as much as, it, yeah, as much as a gesture or a piece of bone or a piece of gold, it didn't matter. It was the action around the material object that created the bond, that created the meaning. And I thought this was a very useful um, way of thinking about value within the museum and the relationship between the material object as a, a prized um, valuable item <clears throat> and how the social choreography around that could be activated much more um, meaningfully than how it currently is at the moment with this segregation by barriers. Charles Escher made an important distinction in his attitude to the permanent collection at Van Abba, labelling it as a toolbox, not a treasure chest. And in Radical Museology, Claire Bishop celebrates the experimental approaches of Van Abba, as well as the Reina Sophia um, and Ljubljana, by saying that, amongst other things, they de-fetishise objects by continually juxtaposing works of art with documentary materials, copies and reconstructions. I'm not 
completely convinced, well, I'm not convinced that the question for us is just to de-fetishize objects. And I'm not convinced that, you know, it is just a future of dematerialized experiential objectlessness that what is what we want or need. But I do think perhaps we've confused liveness with liveliness and they're not the same thing. Perhaps what we're doing by inviting performance into the museum is not to make it necessarily more live only, but also to fetishize action or to make action valuable as a potential. So I would say in terms of choreography, which is one of the questions of this conference, that is, I guess, what choreography does. It, it fetishizes styled, repeated, formalized movement. On one level then, my question would be how via the introduction of movement into the museum, can we fetishize it more or value it more by joining the social and material into a more intense and affecting experience? I'm not suggesting it in a kind of hippie communitas sense necessarily, but um, how, how rather you know, could we resensitize ourselves to understanding objects as embodiments of subjectivity and subjects also having the capacity to transform themselves into objects temporarily to critical and aesthetic ends. Thank you.